And we will move, uh, Ebony, to the quality of education report, agenda item 6C. Great, thank you. Uh, the first slide, uh, I'll just highlight the changes since you guys have seen these slides before um, and they're very slight. Um, so I will say that in our accredited uh, group, we one more institution um, has become accredited. So there are actually are only two left of the schools that had degree programs prior to 2015 um, that are left to become accredited. Um, so that um, gives us a total of 46 accredited, 49 have been closed or their approval has expired, 19 have become exempt, three have an extension currently, um, 22 have surrendered their degrees, and four have suspended degree programs currently, which gives us a total of 143. Next slide, please. Um, these schools um, have been provisionally approved for degree programs um, since January 2015. Um, we have 15 of those have become accredited, 22 have closed um, or their approval has been expired. Um, we have two exempt, um, a change to our surrender degree programs, there are now 13, that's an, an addition of three from the last um, meeting. Um, we have eight who have suspended degrees, that's one more than the last meeting, and 34 are still pursuing accreditation for a total of 84. Next slide, please. The only change here is those that have attained accreditation and it's now 61, which is a gain of one. Next slide. And this again is just um, a visual of the accreditors at those schools who have attained accreditation have chosen. Um, I believe the one change was with ACCSC uh, for that one school that became accredited. Um, I will also say that we still are um, continually tracking those few schools that were previously accredited by ACICS um, and following up on those deadlines as well. So we should have an update um, for you once um, some of those key deadlines pass at our next meeting. Um, I did want to mention that the Quality of Education Unit, um, we did onboard a new ed specialist who has been fully onboarded and processing applications. Unfortunately, we did also lose an ed specialist, so we are actively in the recruiting process um, to fill that position as well. Um, and that is all for Quality of Ed. Are there any questions? Committee members, any questions regarding uh, Quality of Education report? Okay, hearing then, um, Anne, would you please open public comment on agenda item 6C, the quality of education report? Certainly, we've opened up the WebEx Q&A to facilitate public comment. People may use the, may click on the question mark icon, type the word comment and click send, or they may uh, raise their hand by clicking on the hand icon and our call-in users can press star three to raise their hand. And uh, we do have a request to speak from uh, someone logged into WebEx as Tanya Parker Jones. Tanya, I'm going to send your request to unmute and you'll have three minutes with a 30 second warning. And you're unmuted. Um, commend uh, Ebony Santu uh, for her response time. Um, every time I have a question, she's right on it and I appreciate that. It's it's very much appreciated. Um, my question related to the accredited institutions is how realistic is that number when some of the schools that are not, that are unaccredited are, um, and their application doesn't come due for as an accredited institution, how is that factored into the number? Um, simply because a lot of times the schools are told to hold off um, that they don't have to do a, an accredited application because they're already accredited. And thank you for your comment. Um, our next request for comment comes from Robert Johnson. Robert, I will send you a request to unmute and you will have three minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, the question really has been traditionally that the quality education unit is um, a principal factor in the delay of approvals. Um, it's been an accusation over time. It's been discussed um, directly or indirectly. It would be helpful if the Bureau would 
um, isolate on its um, counting of time as to what is the impact of the uh, quality education units uh, approval time in the in the overall approval process. Thank you. And I do not see any other requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, and I uh, would encourage the first commenter. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name. I think maybe it was Tanya. That um, sounded again like maybe you had a question. We don't have opportunity to answer questions in this format. I would encourage you to email bppe.dca.ca.gov um, for a question for specific response. I appreciate uh, both of the public comments. And does that wrap it up, uh, Debbie, for Ms. NT? I believe it does. Thank you so much, Ebony. Thank you. Thanks, Ebony. And on to so item 6D. Perfect. So actually 6D and E will both be presented by Elizabeth Elias, who is one of our enforcement chiefs over annual reports, compliance, and discipline units. Good morning, uh, members of the committee. I will start with the annual report update. Our annual report unit currently has three vacancies, which include a manager and two analysts. The vacant manager and one analyst have been advertised and we are working through the hiring process. We are finalizing the recruitment package for the other um, analyst vacancy and it will be advertised soon. At this time though, I would like to acknowledge the two staff that we do have in our annual reports unit for their continued efforts and commitment to the work that they accomplished day to day. As for a program update, I had hoped that I would be able to provide an update to the data that was presented at the last committee meeting. However, the vendor that runs the application used for reporting annual reports changed its backend database in a way that changed how the data can be accessed. Going forward, the expectation is that the new database will allow for more analytical functionality. However, given the timing that the, of that shift and the timing of this meeting, we were unable to generate any reports for discussion today. Um, staff are currently processing the 2021 annual reports that were submitted to the Bureau, and we are working to identify institutions who have not submitted any report so that we can begin to address, address it um, with issuing citations to those institutions. Uh, next slide. Yeah, annual reports unit staff conduct school performance fact sheet workshops. Um, to help institutions understand the Bureau's laws and regulations. We do have upcoming workshops that will be held on February 23rd, March 23rd, and April 27th. And that concludes the annual report update. If there are any questions or comments from the committee members. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. I'll start off committee questions. Um, have you received as the uh, the annual reports uh, department have you received feedback from institutions at the end of last year or beginning of this that have experienced technical difficulties or concerns with the mechanism for submitting annual reports um it, it appears that every year there are some difficulties because a lot of the institutions wait until the last minute to submit their reports so it does cause um, a lot of traffic to the website so that causes some trouble um for the institutions. Um, they are encouraged to start submitting their inner reports when the portal opens and um, and then to not to wait till the last minute. Um, we also um, have increased um, the number of staff who have the capability to assist with um, institutions with um, when they get locked out of the system. And so our response time has been a lot quicker um, with that as well. Um, and the feedback that we do give, we try to take it into consideration and find ways that we can um, help the institutions when submitting their reports. And you indicated that staff is currently working on notifying institutions who have not submitted uh, uh, by the deadline, the annual report. Uh, we are working to identify the schools who have not submitted an annual report. Um, and then they will be noticed by a citation um, for failure to submit the annual report um, by the required due date. Committee members, any other questions regarding the annual report update?
Um, I, I have one more. Do you anticipate, given the the glitch in the reporting, do you anticipate that will be resolved by our next meeting and we'll be able to see data at that time? That is my hope. I do anticipate um, some progress. Um, there were some issues. It, the database transition happened at the end of November, so I have recently received some updates um, with some more um, reporting mechanisms, uh, but I still need to follow up to make sure that I can get similar data that we reported on at the previous meeting. Uh, hearing no other committee questions or feedback, we'll go ahead and open to, <clears throat> excuse me, public comment for agenda item 6D, the annual report update. Thank you. And we've opened up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If anyone would like to comment on the annual report topic, you can look for the question mark icon, type the word comment into that text box and click send or raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon. And our call-in users can press star three to raise their hand. Each speaker will have three minutes to speak. Are there any comments on the annual report presentation? I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll move on to agenda item 6E and the compliance and discipline report. Thank you. Um, I will speak to the compliance unit first. The compliance units uh, have several vacancies, which do include a manager, three analysts, and one support staff. Some of the vacancies um, in that unit um, are due to promotions to other areas of the Bureau. Uh, we have also recently completed interviews for the manager and one of the analysts and anticipate extending offers um, for those vacancies in the future. Um, the other vacancies are currently in the recruitment stage. That said, I am also happy to announce that we did onboard a new analyst that started with the Bureau at the end of December. I would also like to thank the compliance staff for their efforts and especially Michelle Allegar, my one compliance manager who has stepped up to assist with both compliance units while, re while we recruit and hire the vacant manager. Um, next slide. Despite the vacancies, completed inspections are on track to meet the number of inspections conducted during fiscal year 21-22. As you see in fiscal year 1920, there was an increase in the number of unannounced inspections. Per statute, we are mandated to conduct one announced and one unannounced inspection every five years. Currently, the pendulum is swinging to more announced inspections. Nevertheless, we also consider many factors in determining which type of inspection should be conducted and will assign an unannounced inspection as needed based on those factors. Of the inspections completed this fiscal year, um, next slide. <clears throat> this slide is just a visual representation of the data from the last slide. Um, next slide. Um, of the inspections completed this fiscal year, about 48% um, require additional action due to the violations identified during the inspection. Because of those continued violations, compliance staff conduct workshops. Next slide. Um, to help institutions better understand the Bureau's laws and regulations. During these workshops, institutions are provided information regarding common violations identified during an inspection um, and how to maintain compliance. Compliance staff recently conducted a workshop this week and another one is scheduled for March 15th, um, 2023. And that concludes my presentation for the compliance unit. If there are any questions from the committee. Open for comments or questions from the committee. Yes, hi, this is Margaret. Um, over time, I have asked about being able to search on the website for recent inspections and recent inspection results. And it's not really possible, as far as I can tell, to do that now. You have to kind of go school by school. Uh, I assume, uh, and correct me if this isn't correct, that the schools inspected and the inspection results uh, are public information. 
Um, and I would request that future reports uh, would identify the schools inspected uh, as well as the, uh, by, you know, the, the determination, the actions uh, required as a result of those inspections, or at minimum, identify the schools inspected um, and the dates of inspection so that then one could take those and go onto the website and check and see the results. I think the results are listed there by school. Um, and uh, I understand that that's probably not a useful um, online function for students, but it would be a useful online function for, I think, advisory committee members as well as uh, enforcement uh, folks in other agencies. But if that's not going to be done on the website, at least I would ask that there be a listing provided, uh, preferably on a, month, a monthly listing, but if not, at least by quarter. Um, and, you know, that could probably then just be generated as a PDF almost on the website. But if not that, at least provide it to the advisory committee meetings. Thank you. Thank you. I will definitely take that feedback. Um, we are currently working on a similar list, but for disciplinary actions. Um, so I will take this feedback and see what we can do um, as it relates to the compliance inspections. That's great. I'm glad you're doing that on disciplinary actions because the same thing. And and uh, in relation to that, I think there's supposed to be a report annually on the website of disciplinary actions, and it's not been updated for many years. So in connection, maybe it can be updated there as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. I would encourage you to adopt a table format used by OSAR for several years now. Uh, in reference to the workshops that you described, the compliance workshops that you're doing, it would be helpful to see the date, subject matter, and participants, number of institutions participating in those workshops over time. I will take that info, take that back and look at what we can do. Thanks. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Um, this is Melanie Delgado. I just noticed that um, your inspections canceled in um, the first quarter of 22-23 of seem to be pretty high. And I appreciate that you have the reasons for canceled inspections. Is there anything else that's going on there? Any reason that so many of those seem to have been canceled in the first quarter? Um, I do not have specifics to that number today, but I can bring that back to a future meeting and provide you some more context. Thanks. Hearing no more committee feedback, uh, we'll go ahead and open to public comment if you would do that for us, Anne. Certainly, and we're opening up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If anyone has any public comment on the report, you can click on the question mark icon, type the word comment and click send, or anyone may raise their hand to ask to be recognized by clicking on the hand icon and our call-in users can press star three to raise their hand. Each person will have three minutes to speak. Is there any request for comment? And I do not see any requests for public comment. Shall I close that feature? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. We'll move on now, uh, Debbie, to agenda item 6F, the complaint and investigation report. Uh, I'm sorry, I still have a, a I'm sorry, Debbie. <laughs> Go for it. Oh, I still have a discipline update. Um, oh, I see. As so well. compliance and discipline are held separately under 6E. Sorry about that. Yes. Um, so I'll move on to the discipline update. Our discipline unit currently has two analyst vacancies. I am happy to announce that on February 1st, Renee Walters, who was an analyst in the, the discipline unit, was promoted to manager. She has been instrumental in the progress we have made this month alone. I would also like to take to thank the discipline team for their hard work. Um, next slide. Thank you. The data captured in this slide is as of quarter two, which ended December 31st, 2022. During this quarter, we were effective in pursuing a PC-23, 
which is an order resulting from a criminal legal proceeding where a judge may order that an individual who's pending criminal charges be suspended or restricted in their position with an approved institution in the interest of public protection. Um, of note, we actually recently were successful in another PC23 request, um, but that number will be noted in the, Q the quarter three data at the next meeting. Additionally, the Bureau was successful in a revocation of our approval to operate um, an institution during this quarter. Next slide. Regarding actions resulting from a statement of issues, we had um, one denied approval to operate upheld and one denial withdrawn due to mitigation received, which satisfied the deficiencies identified in the denied application. Next slide. During quarter two, we issued an emergency decision and one automatic suspension of an approval to operate a degree granting program. Next slide. We currently have 14 cases at the Attorney General's office um, pending disciplinary action. 11 of those cases have been filed, um, eight which are accusations and three statement of issues, and those cases are currently pending final outcomes. Due to staffing challenges and redirected focus to address higher pressing and time sensitive disciplinary cases where there's a potential for greater harm, we have not issued as many citations, which is reflected in our numbers during quarter two. These numbers do not reflect a lack of violations being identified by Bureau staff. There is currently a backlog of citations to be issued resulting from violations for failure to submit annual fees, strip fees, annual reports, and less egregious violations identified during inspections. And then just in summary, my section, which includes um, the annual report, compliance and discipline teams currently has about a 35% vacancy rate. My primary focus is to fill all of the vacancies expeditiously while also reviewing our business processes to identify areas where we can be more effective. We have made some recent changes within the inner report compliance and discipline units, and I am confident that those changes will be reflected in the data presented at future committee meetings and will demonstrate an increase in the disciplinary actions, which include citations and a decrease in our backlog of files that are pending um, our discipline review. Are there any um, questions from the committee? Committee, any questions or comments for the discipline, disciplinary actions under 60? Yes, I'm embarrassed to say, but I have been told this many times and I still don't remember what is the difference between an enforcement resulting from an accusation and one from a statement of issues. And I suspect I may not be the only one on the committee that has that problem, maybe I am, but uh, if possible in the next reporting, could you just have a little uh, explanation or explaining the difference between those two on the chart so that, uh, uh, for those of us who can't remember, it's there. And then the the uh, question or comment I have is on the cases at the Attorney General's office, once they have been, I understand you said filed, which I assume is the same as served or transmitted. That means basically this, the action is now, uh, the, the institution is aware of it. And it, that is in effect a public matter at that point once it's been filed. Um, so when you are figuring out um, providing information about schools that have had actions, uh, either disciplinary or citation, I think that this would be something that could also be um, uh, provided to us by the name of the school. Uh, because I think, uh, and if I'm wrong, that's fine, but uh, but if it is public information at that point, then that, that those schools should be identified also. Thank you. Yes, um, just to speak on that a little bit, an accusation is an action, um, where we file charges against an institution who already has an approval by the Bureau, where we're trying to um, take action against whatever approval operate that they may have. And a statement of issues is typically filed um, for an applicant. So one is for a licensee and one is for an applicant. Um, and then as far as cases that are transmitted to the AG, 
Um, when we say that we transmit a case to the Attorney General's office, that means that we've requested the Attorney General's office to assist us in preparation of the disciplinary case. And when we say that cases have been filed, that is when the um, institution has been noticed that there are pending charges for violations um, that we have um, captured. And um, to answer the question, we are um, in the final stages of working on the sheet that will be posted on our website, um, actions by month, and that would include um, all disciplinary actions, um, actions where we have filed charges that are currently pending, citations, and then um, any other disciplinary um, actions that may be taken by the by the bureau. So um, I expect to have that in place um, by the next um, committee meeting um, on our website. That's terrific. Uh, glad to hear that. And the, the column I was talking about, I think we're talking about the same thing, is the one that says total served of transmitted. So those have not just been given to the AG. The AG has actually served the school, correct? Correct. Uh, okay. Served would be the same as filed. Um, so the, the school has been noticed and it is public information at that time. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. And that, Good. I have a couple of quick questions or comments. Um, uh, first, regarding uh, the reduction in citations, and you indicated um, a prioritization or triage in which you're you're choosing or uh, focusing resources on those that are the most material, represent the greatest uh, risk of harm to students. Uh, can you describe to us who is involved in that decision making? Like, what's the group of opinion leaders that? look at those and make that decision. Is that done by line staff? Are you involved directly in that? Who at the Bureau is deciding which are the most important issues to pursue? Uh, that is definitely done at my level and above um, in coordination with um, Debbie and the other enforcement chief as well, um, and also um, in consultation with our legal. Um, but primarily it's done at my level. Um, one of the challenges was that I did not have another manager in our discipline unit at that time. Um, now that we do have a discipline manager, um, a lot of the refocus can um, now be so that we can address more of the citations that have not been issued um, because I have a little bit more assistance. Um, but definitely the focus on what cases take priority over others um, is at my level and above. Thanks. And then second, in your review of uh, prioritizing and triage, and then also looking at your business processes and looking, so you have your staffing issues, and then you're looking at efficiencies in process. Have you found any early promising indicators of things that you might be able to simplify or streamline to improve your uh, the efficiency in your department? Definitely. We um, actually have started to work on um, a new citation process and the citation template has already been implemented, the new citation template uh, that, we're, that we're using, um, and it's been working really great. Um, in fact, the data doesn't show it because it's, in, it's currently happening, but um, as of this month so far, we have already issued, I believe it's between eight to 10 citations, um, and we still have another two weeks left in this month, so I anticipate us um, issuing more citations uh, before the month ends. So I definitely think there will be a drastic increase in the um, review of the cases and getting citations issues that have been pending um, in that backlog. And to the degree you're, you have a backlog of citations or you have known violations, you plan on issuing a citation, but you have not yet done so, what accommodation will be made uh, in the process, if any, to institutions who receive a citation for something that now is aged uh, and potentially already resolved by that time, for example? So somebody didn't submit their fact sheet. You don't know that they didn't submit it because of data errors or other concerns. And then six months later, you say, hey, you didn't submit that, and it's since been submitted. Will that, how will that citation be handled? So all cases are reviewed prior to sending out a citation if there are minor violations um, and part of the review process is to determine whether or not um, the violation that we're trying to <clears throat> cite for has been resolved. Okay. Um, we do make some effort to not issue citations, um, but there are other circumstances where 
regardless of whether it's been corrected, it's still a violation that does need to be noted so that we can work with the schools to, um, you know, correct um, non-compliance um, in the future because we often find that there is repeated non-compliance um, with, with institutions. So we, we do need to make it um, noticed so that we have a record of it so that if there is continued non-compliance, we can take additional action and, and be more successful in that action um, if needed. Got it, thank you. Committee members, any other questions or comments for the disciplinary actions? Okay, and then we're gonna go ahead um, and open for public comment again on 6E on the second half. Apologize for my mistake and uh, jumping the gun. So open again for public comment, this time on disciplinary actions specifically. Thank you, and we've opened up the WebEx Q&A to facilitate public comment. If you have a comment on the disciplinary actions report, you can click on the question mark, type the word comment and click send, or raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon and our calling users can press star three to raise their hand. Are there any questions? I do not see any questions at this time. Shall I close the public comment? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Now for reals, we'll move on to agenda item six at the complaint and investigation. Wonderful, and that for that, we'll turn over to our other enforcement chief, Daniel Rangel. Thank you, Daniel. There we go, can you hear me? All right, uh, good morning, um, committee members. Uh, my name is Daniel Rangel, I'm the enforcement chief over complaints and investigations. I'll be going over uh, the, the statistics that we have for uh, quarters one and two of the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so starting off, we're looking at our complaints received. I know that um, in, in prior meetings we discussed uh, um, when I've explained um, the significant amount of complaints that we've been receiving, um, you know, here within the last uh, few fiscal years and just kind of looking at the comparisons um, from one fiscal year to the next, uh, going back to 2021 um, and comparing the increase to 2022, there was a 25% increase in the amount of complaints that we received um, from, from that fiscal year to the next. Uh, and then subsequently from 2021-22 fiscal year to the current one, um, we're projecting an 11% increase. I know with this fiscal year, we only have uh, two quarters, um, but just looking at the uh, amounts that we received in those first two quarters and, and projecting out, uh, we're looking at an 11% increase. Um, my hope is that, that um, Looking at the uh, the line, the trend line, which we'll also see later on in another slide, um, there there has been a slight decrease um, over the last couple of months and in the in quarter two, um, and uh, which kind of has uh, um, evened out that uh, trend line. It's not as steep, but yet it's still climbing. Um, I'm hoping that that's uh, a, a trend that will continue to go down uh, to provide a little relief uh, for our my team. I know that we've been working diligently um, to try to resolve these complaints uh, in the most efficient manner, but also making our focus on the quality of the investigations that we have. Um, and uh, so I, I just wanted to thank, you know, my managers um, who have been working diligently and all of the um, investigative and, and analytical staff that we have. Um, one of the things I, I guess I should have started out with is we, we currently um, are close to um, uh, fully staffed. Uh, we have currently one vacancy for our office technician position, uh, and we have uh, an analyst position that's vacant. And then we do have one manager position that's vacant. The manager position, we are uh, working to uh, upgrade the duties of that uh, position to better reflect um, the goals of the unit. Um, so those those are all in the well the the two are in the recruitment process and the manager process is um, currently being worked on. Um, one thing of significant note is now that we are full uh, close to fully staffed, um, uh, I, I would say over half of the unit um, is currently on on a, on their probationary period. So um, trying to get acclimated with the 
um, the bureau and um, and and everything that we're trying to accomplish. Um, so, and, and that includes two of my managers, um, myself. I've just recently hit my year here with the bureau, so um, I'm assuming I passed the probationary period. <laughs> um, and and I'm happy to to be here, and um, I look forward to to what we can accomplish in the future. Um, but I wanted to give that um, quick update when uh, talking about the complaints received. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are the just a comparison of the complaints received, uh, the contracted versus the uh, non-contracted schools, um, and then also looking at the amount of schools that account for the total amount of uh, complaints that we've received so far. So um, we've received uh, 583 complaints so far in the first two quarters, and um, that could be accounted to 416 uh, institutions. Next slide, please. Looking at the, the complaints closed, um, there, there is, uh, we are trending lower than previous years. Uh, although um, the next two quarters are generally the years where we, the, not years, the generally the quarters that we see uh, a higher increase um, in the closures. Um, and we do anticipate that we will, um, that trend will continue in these next two quarters for us. Um, I know that um, uh, we are, you know, kind of getting our, our feet under us and, and moving forward with a lot of significant projects, such as um, making our process more use. I'm having trouble so, hearing. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Daniel, your audio just got a little fuzzier just about 30 seconds ago. Okay. Can you hear me now? That's better. Okay. Maybe if I sit a little closer to the. Um, so I know that we're working uh, to uh, make our process. That was not. Uh, again. That sound disappeared again. Uh, I guess you can, can you hear me now? Uh, I think maybe the mic switched for you. If you look on the arrow next to the mute and unmute button, there's a selection for microphone. If you have multiple options there, you might try a different one. It sounds like maybe the microphone switched during your presentation. It's the little arrow right next to the mute, unmute button. There we go. That's the same, yeah. It sounds like you're underwater a little bit for me. This is the moderator and occasionally extensive use of cameras can affect bandwidth issues. If you would like, you can try without the camera and see if that helps your audio issue. Okay, well, we'll do that. Does that uh, help any better? We can hear you now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. We'll see uh, how it, we'll see how it stays. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I also tried switching the mic, so thank you, um, uh, Mr. Holt. Um, hopefully that that will resolve it. Um, so just going back to what I was saying, we we have been focusing on making our processes more uniform, um, our uh, investigative reports more uniform, to streamline the review processes, to be able to move those forward um, as quickly as possible. Um, if there are violations identified, um, I know that our my management team and I have been working. Um, extensively alongside um, our investigative staff uh, to ensure that the uh, investigations progress uh, within a timely manner um, and trying to remove any hurdles or roadblocks or, or bottlenecks in the process. Um, and us being involved uh, with the process, we are able to identify those things more quickly uh, and address them as quickly as we can. Um, and um, I expect to see uh, the results of that as we continue to move forward. I know that um, a lot of staff are transitioning to um, uh, moving, being more independent in their investigations as well, um, which is a sign that they're they're progressing in their uh, growth and their knowledge uh, and understanding of what, what our expectations are as a team. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is just a, a breakdown of the uh, closed complaints and the days uh, to close the complaints. Um, I know that we have um, 
emphasize on uh, trying to resolve the matters within the year, uh, more specifically within the 180 day mark, which a, 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 a large or significant amount of our cases are closed within the 180 day mark. Uh, and then we have some that come into that uh, one to two year um, and, um, and above a year and then the one to two years. Uh, so we are working to kind of push that number to the left um, and have uh, more significant numbers in, in the uh, lower end uh, to show that our efficiency of moving these cases forward, but also with the emphasis of quality of our investigations. Next slide. Uh, so this is just a, a closure a disposition of our cases and a breakdown of what uh, types of closures that we have. Um, and uh, just noting that um, we are seeing um, a, a higher percentage of our cases uh, moving forward to uh, the discipline unit, I was kind of doing some uh, review of prior years, and I know that uh, the reporting from prior years is not in fiscal years, so um, it's a, it's, it was a little difficult with that. But uh, just looking at uh, 2019, there was about 8% of the cases being referred to discipline. Uh, 2020, there was about 4 In 2021, there was about 7%. Uh, currently, um, we are projecting to have about, uh, well, currently we have about 13% of our cases that are going to discipline. Um, and I, I also credit much of that to focusing on the quality of our investigations and um, being clear and identifying when there is an issue and, and uh, moving that forward to our discipline unit to take appropriate action. Next slide, please. And then this is a, a breakdown of the uh, cases that are referred to our discipline unit and uh, what are the categories that those referrals are being made for. Um, we are uh, making a concerted effort to identify those uh, unapproved institutions um, and uh, take appropriate action um, on, uh, on those and, and uh, making sure that gets corrected. This uh, next slide is, um, it's not a new slide, it's different than what we presented in the past, but it, uh, we're trying to work with our visual, visual representation of the complaints that are closed at intake. Um, and what their, the reasons for closure are. Um, and to address one of the questions that um, Ms. Uh, Reader had um, presented at the last uh, advisory committee meeting about um, adding um, additional resources when we do close a case that's non-jurisdiction uh, or exempt under 2,500, um, I am happy to report that I connected with my uh, intake team and, and um, and we have added those resources that she had mentioned with the legal aid and the um, small claims courts uh, to the as an attachment to the uh, closures for those type of cases to provide additional resources to those uh, uh, individuals um, in trying to resolve their issues. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a breakdown of our pending caseload. Um, and as you can see, a majority of them are within the two years. Uh, uh, the vast majority is in um, within the one-year mark, which is where we're trying to um, set our cutoff and our, our uh, expectations and our goals um, as a unit uh, to address uh, these complaints within a year. Um, again, in past um, uh, meetings, I've talked about trying to keep it within the 180 days and. Um, I know with the significant amount of complaints that we've been receiving, um, that's been uh, a difficult uh, challenge. It's quite quite a bit of a challenge. Uh, so we are focusing on trying to keep them within that year mark. Um, again, focusing on efficiency um, as our, the staff progresses and grows and um, gets a clear understanding of what the expectations are um, and understanding why the, the decisions are made. Um, during the course of the investigations, they're able to make um, uh, quicker, more accurate, um, uh, informed decisions, which will uh, lead to um, the efficiency and, and the quicker processing of these investigations. Next slide, please. And again, this is the, the trend line that I was referencing at the beginning, um, that it is kind of um, evening out, but still uh, tr with an upward um, trajectory. Um, and again, we are focusing on trying to move, improve our processes to be more efficient. Um, I know that just in my, the year that I've been here, 
Um, a lot of that year has been just evaluating what are the needs of the unit. Um, at the same time, it's, it's been an uphill battle in, in filling positions. Um, I talked about the, the significant turnover that we've had um, and uh, the impact that that's had, um, but also looking at the needs of the unit and uh, identifying where we can be better um, and how, how us as managers can better serve our team. Um, and that has been a huge focus and we found uh, a lot of room for growth in that area um, and improvement. And um, my, my expectation is that will uh, begin to pay off as we move into this next year and we focus on those issues in correcting them, uh, which we've already started addressing um, at the end of uh, last year. And um, we're, we're hoping to see the impact of that coming this coming year. Next slide, please. And this is just a breakdown of our student impact to date. Um, I know that um, we, I just wanted to note that I know that we are also not just focusing on uh, the quality of our investigations, but also looking for opportunities uh, to be proactive um, when we do receive complaints and there's not uh, a violation that has been uh, committed yet that we have been proactive, myself and um, the other managers on my team, in reaching out to those schools to resolve issues before they become an issue. Um, or resolve student concerns before they become an issue. So we've also been taking those opportunities um, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, report that we've had positive experiences with those. Um, and I know that that's another factor that will assist us in, in um, moving some of these complaints um, to uh, resolution. And I believe that concludes my presentation, I'll uh, turn that back over to you, Mr. Holt. Do you have any questions? Thank you, uh, Daniel. Committee, any questions or comments, feedback for uh, in regards to complaint investigations? This is Margaret. <clears throat> I appreciate it very much you're pointing out that uh, you are trying to have more quality uh, closures of complaints and that of course takes more time and I'm well aware of that as having worked in uh, a consumer um, agency where we took complaints and there is always the trade-off between getting things closed as quickly as possible and getting them handled the way they need to be handled so I appreciate that you are uh, staying focused on getting them handled properly um, so that uh, students do get the relief that, that they should be entitled to I, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is on the, uh, this I guess relates to our page 65, uh, discipline unit referrals um, and identifying the types of things that are being referred. And I know that we've, we've talked about this in the past where the system did, the existing system did not let you distinguish very easily among different types of uh, issues. And I think that there, you've been working on that and have improved that. Uh, one thing I'm wondering is, um, is there a way to separate out um, schools' fact sheets that are not accurate um, as a category? Because I, I think that that's an area where we have the rule, we have it in place, but I question how accurate those actually are. Um, and that kind of relates to my earlier thought about do we want to you know, make it easy for students to link to that? Are we confident that those are accurate enough that they are, are good information? But that is one question I have is can you um, separate out any complaints related to the fact sheet? And I guess the, the other issue is, you know, the complaint itself may not relate to the fact sheet, but your investigation may determine that in fact um, part of the problem was that the fact sheet gave inaccurate information to the student. Uh, so that's one question I have. I have another one, but if you want to respond to that and then I'll go on. Yes. Um, so you you are correct in that um, uh, there are cases where the complaint may not have been related to the fact sheet, but during the course of the investigation um, that would be identified. Um, it's I know that we we've had our internal discussions about how do we best capture um, 
the the complaints moving forward and, and how do we categorize them because there are often complaints that fall within multiple categories um and uh, a lot of times what ends up sticking is what the original um how the case the case was originally classified uh so i know that 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 is a great point um because i know that that can kind of evolve um as we move the the case forward um and then sometimes um, the issue that was initially the focus um, is not the issue that, that ends up moving forward. And, and uh, you know, that's that's because a lot of times the students will will just submit their complaint and not understand what the laws are related to everything they're complaining about. Um, and that's where it's our job to identify what are the applicable laws or what are the possible laws that are being violated and determining uh, whether or not there's evidence to support those allegations or um or uh, or disprove those allegations um so that that is a great point that i'll take back to my team and, and continue to discuss and and seeing if if we need to uh, adjust that um, referral reason if it has evolved throughout the course of the investigation right because presumably when you're referring it by that time you have determined that you think there's a violation of a particular provision which presumably then would be the basis of the referral. So maybe at that point in the investigation, you could identify it that way rather than by what the student initially complained about. So that's something, uh, yeah, something to consider anyway. Uh, the, um, another question I had is on the student impact page, uh, it's page, uh, I believe it's 69. Um, it, one of the things you've done is canceled, I've been able to cancel the uh, income sharing agreements. And I had a question here. How do you handle that? The student is signed up with an income sharing agreement, and that is a violation. And um, presumably that contract then is either void or voidable. Um, and the student is uh, somewhere along in the course. What What is the uh, remedy then for the student? How, how do you work that out? In other words, do they still pay? How do they pay? Or is because the contract was voided, they only have to they have a new contract only for what's remaining in the course. Um, how do you how do how do you handle those? Um, it's it's a it's a dynamic situation with with those um, and a lot of the um, newer types of complaints that we receive and and how how do we address those? Um, I think with the uh, income shared agreements, um, we have partnered with other. Uh, regulatory agencies that have assisted us um, or can better assist the students in those uh, instances um, and have referred those matters over to them. Uh, we What we do is address um, what laws are applicable to the situation that we can apply, if any, um, and then uh, rely on the support of those other institutions. And I think that that's, that's, um, that's, a, that's, Probably a huge factor of why we're receiving a, a lot more complaints because of our collaboration with other unit, other units, other regulatory agencies um, that we've had we have ongoing communications with that uh, refer cases over to us or uh, vice versa, where we uh, rely on their um, better suited expertise to address the issues and assist the students. So it, in those instances, um, it wouldn't be reflected in our numbers here but we know that um, we, we do follow up with those institutions to see what is the outcome uh, and how they were able to assist the students um, and sharing that with our team obviously is is important to uh, uh, share those wins um, and how we're able to help individuals right so i i understand that so that might be and i forget the name of the other agency that had the business and whatever whatever agency uh that deals with those kind of things uh, i would just uh ask maybe to learn a little bit more about this because that's the kind of thing where you could also have something slipping through the cracks between the agencies. I mean, your your goal is to get that contract canceled, but then do we know if the other agency is actually, um, what relief the student is getting? I mean, they, are they not having to pay anything on the contract? Is the school being allowed to set well, I guess that would be your part of it. Is the school allowed to then propose a new contract to the student? Or is this only occurring after the student has finished and so the whole contract is either void or voidable? Um, I, I would be uh, interested to learn a little bit more about that because a contract that is unlawful typically 
is considered, I think, void, which would mean the school would not be able to collect anything on that. And I just wonder how those are being handled. So maybe something to just get a little more information about. Thanks. We'll definitely take that back and 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 do some more research and hopefully be able to provide um, more information that in the future. Committee, any other questions, comments, or feedback for Daniel? Very good. Hearing none, we'll go ahead and move to uh, open public comment for agenda item 6F, the complaint and investigation report. Thank you. We've opened up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If you'd like to make a comment on the complaint investigations report, you can click on the question mark, type the word comment and click send, or you may raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon and our calling users can press star three to raise their hand. Our first request for comment comes from Robert Johnson. Robert, I'm gonna send you a request to unmute your microphone and you'll have three minutes. Well, thank you. Um, what's not here is the disposition of the number of cases that the Bureau is referring to the Attorney General's office. It would be very illuminative for the council to see the results of those cases that the Bureau refers for action from the Attorney General. Um, does not have to be specific, but at least a general count of the win, lose, and draws that come from that process. Thank you. And I do not see any other requests for public comment. Shall I close that public comment feature? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, committee and, and other attendees, I'm uh, sensitive to the fact we've been running for a little over two hours now. We have just two more uh, um, letters to go through in six. We're, we're going to go ahead and press through there and then we'll discuss a break after that. So just wanted to give you a heads up that we're coming close. We'll move on to agenda, agenda item 6G and the uh, OSAR report. And for that, of course, we have Scott Valverde, OSAR chief. Thank you, uh, Joseph, and thank you, uh, Debbie. Um, happy to see all of you and hear hear from all of you, um, and happy to provide an update on OSAR's activities uh, through the close of the second quarter of uh, fiscal year 22-23. So um, I'll actually, before we start with the charts, I'll also mention that we um, have two vacancies in OSAR as well. So. Uh, with eight allocated positions, when you have two vacancies, you definitely feel that. And so um, I wanted to thank uh, all my staff and uh, my staff manager for all the hard work uh, that's being done as we um, both try to fill those two positions actively and then also accomplish all the things that we're accomplishing as um, evidenced in these reports. So that's that. So going on to chart uh, A, um, which is our uh, informed choice outreach and educational activities. Again, this is capturing data uh, from the first two quarters of fiscal year 22, 23. Uh, in this quarter, we reached a total of um, uh, 1,458 students uh, during the quarter, which brought our total for the fiscal year up to 1,538, if you go to the next page. Um, for uh, this particular category, which again are um, uh, college fairs and events and workshops and outreach campaigns uh, targeting uh, prospective students and helping them in their um, hopefully ability to make an informed choice uh, based on the, their next step uh, in higher education. Uh, one side note before I talk a little bit more about the Sweet Cardona uh, assistance campaign is that um, you can anticipate uh, quite a significant bump up in these numbers in this particular chart in the next meeting, uh, capturing quarter three, as we've recently had back to back to back uh, three very large um, events that we participated in, um, which really um, I think is reflective of this sort of quasi uh, post COVID um, time that we're living in right now, where more in-person events uh, and opportunities are being presented to us and the, the student attendance of those events are going up um, noticeably and appreciably. So um, you'll see some 
a, a spike in these numbers in, the, in our next meeting. Um, you can anticipate that. As it relates to this data, um, uh, a large uh, portion of, of this increase, up to 1,538 students reached during the quarter for these types of activities are, uh, are in the Sweet Cardona student um, assistance campaign. Um, it was kind of a unique effort uh, that OSAR uh, was part of uh, related to the Sweet Cardona settlement. I'm, I'm thinking that probably most of you are familiar uh, with that uh, case, but if not, that was a um, settlement that was reached between a, a, a class of plaintiffs and the U.S. Department of Education, um, where the terms of that settlement were basically that two classes were established. The one was for any students who had filed a borrower's defense to repayment claim um, as of the time of the settlement uh, from a list of specific schools. Uh, those students would have their federal loan balances automatically discharged as well as reimbursements for prior payments made on those loans. And then the second class that was established was for students who had filed borrower's defense claims from any other school uh, not named in the first class. And for those claimants, uh, the Department of Education agreed to uh, an expedited a uh, process with some specific insured timelines to process those claims. So this was all happening in in the middle part of last year. Um, and in light of that, the California Attorney General's Office sought to inform students who had previously reached out to their office and, and filed complaints about the um, possibility of, of borrower's defense discharges and updated information as a result of this uh, settlement. So um, they reached out uh, to me, reached out to us and asked for our willingness to serve as a, a point of contact in the outreach that they intended to conduct for students, uh, uh, for those students who are interested in hands-on support. Um, and so we agreed uh, to support the AG's office in that way. Um, and also, uh, in follow up to that, uh, sent a letter to the same group of students uh, reminding them of, of, of OSAR services. And as a result, um, we did, as, as, as evidenced here in this chart, you know, made contact with 1,300 students. Um, and as a result, 152 students uh, responded to us as a direct result of that effort. Um, and those, that's in the form of emails and, and, and phone calls that will be captured in a future chart. And um, we also set up one-on-one -on -one appointments with 66 students to date um, as a result of that effort. And we're still getting um, some, some calls and emails trickling in, so that number may increase as well. Uh, we've met with these students about a wide variety of topics. Again, so the, the, the original um, outreach from the AG's office and ours was pretty pretty uh, narrow, um, but as, as is commonly the case uh, with student populations like this, uh, once they've uh, found out about us and found out the services we provide and reached out to us, we've been, helped to, been able to help them in a variety of different ways outside of just uh, information regarding their borrower's defense claims. So we've met with students about transcript issues and accessing other um, documents and records. Um, uh, some of them talked to us about issues they've had with other schools that they've subsequently transferred to or, or moved on to or, or um, have a, a other needs related to. Uh, some of them had also filed STRIF claims as well um, or were asking about STRIF um, and, and many other services as well. So it was kind of an entree into a specific audience that 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 um, was kind of about one thing, but 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 our uh, our, the, the, the ability for us to provide services were, were turned out to be a lot more broader and for, again, a significant number of students. Um, so, um, and, and obviously it, it bumped up the volume of our work in this particular quarter, as I mentioned, while we're a little bit understaffed as well. So I think, I thought that was worth highlighting. Uh, moving on to chart B, which is our um, outreach effort, other miscellaneous outreach efforts. This is generally like, um, school closures where um, most of the information is done through through email as opposed to an in-person or virtual workshop, which will be in the next chart. Um, and then also um, you'll notice that per the footnote there, we also reached out to three schools um, in this particular quarter. We've actually reached out to more schools than that previously, but in this particular quarter, we did outreach for three schools that were formerly um, or provisionally accredited by ACICS and were impacted or potentially impacted by the derecognition of ACICS. So 
sent out general information to them about um, OSAR and um, kind of in a timely sort of way to kind of look at sort of the way our, our, our outreach work sort of stacks upon each other. So as of September, we started that outreach with, with one of the uh, colleges here, Southwestern uh, California University. And uh, we just recently found out that, um, that, that they are closing as well. So, so we, by doing that initial outreach, that proactive early outreach, we've already got sort of an existing uh, contact and relationship with those students. So hopefully the, that'll help the closure process go more smoothly. Uh, that's definitely the, the plan. So uh, in this uh, quarter, we uh, reached 295 more students uh, in this category uh, for a total of 310 for the next, for the full fiscal, for the fiscal year to date. I'm sorry. So if you can go to the next chart, you see that three, 310 number. Uh, moving on to chart C which are our actual workshops. So again, closure um, in-person workshop, virtual workshops. Uh, we had, um, let's see, another 185 students that we reached via workshops that we conducted in Q2 for a total of 247 fiscal year to date. Um, it's worth noting, or at least notable, that um, the last three have all been cosmetology schools. There's also another cosmetology school in our in our uh, email outreach as well, and another and another one that's happened, um, you know, since since we gathered this data in in Q3. So, not exactly sure whether there's something we can speak to in terms of that being a trend or any particular reason or any relationship. But but it's it's again that it speaks for itself that our last uh, a, a high percentage of our work in closed school recently have been in cosmetology schools. Um, moving on to chart D, um, again, D and E are two charts that we added uh, this fiscal year, um, uh, which are our call logs um, and our email logs that we uh, have staff uh, report into our internal system and by specific categories that we've developed, as well as another category that we've talked about in previous Meeting. So um, we had uh, 390 more new incoming first time calls from students this quarter uh, for a total of 736 uh, fiscal year to date. I think the sweet Cardona impact is definitely captured here. As again, I mentioned, many of those students had a, had, a, had had needs such as um, loan relief, uh, transcript assistance and and other so. I think that's where you see some of that impact as well, and which again will will be reflected in future reports as well as those that impact trickled into Q3 as well. Uh, moving on to chart E is our emails uh, received again to, uh, tracked in the same way with the same with the same categories. Um, 244 additional emails this quarter for a total of 560 um, at the close of Q2. Um, some of the things that we're seeing uh, in other, I know we've talked about this before, Margaret has asked about, uh, uh, Ms. Ryder has asked about this before as well, which are, um, you know, what types of things are captured under other. Um, we talked about complaints in the past, that, that continues to be uh, one of the significant ones in there, are either how do I file a complaint, or I have filed a complaint, what's the status of that complaint, um, assistance with filing a complaint, et cetera. Uh, we also have, Quite a significant number of calls that we get um, that are ver the the caller is asking for verification of a of a degree or transcript for employment pur purposes. Um, the other thing that's captured in there is we have quite a few calls that end up as being an appropriate referral to another agency. Uh, we just Daniel just mentioned uh, DFPI um, being one. Um, Veteran Affairs is another. Um, U.S. Department of Education, et cetera. There are oftentimes where we assist the students the most we possibly can, but ultimately um, it, it ends up being in uh, what they really need is, is provided by another agency. So that those are also captured under other. And then chart F, um, my apologies, was just actually left in an error. That was a, a holdover from the previous meeting where we were um, showing uh, the previous fiscal year summary. So I apologize for that. That is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Committee, any questions, comments, or feedback regarding OSAR report? I just have a comment, and that is, you know, a few years ago, I'm not sure when exactly when OSAR was set up, 
uh, we were hopeful, I think, that it would make an impact. And I think we can see uh, now that it really is making an impact, uh, having that assistance available that students were not able to find before. Uh, one question I have is, uh, are, uh, are you still doing just outreach workshops? And if so, are, are those uh, listed, upcoming workshops listed on the website somewhere? I was looking around, I didn't see where those are. Yes, events where um, we have either uh, booked like a closed school uh, workshop or if we've been invited to participate in, a, in, in uh, uh, an event that may have a workshop component, we do and are posting those um, on our website and I can um, direct you to where that, where that link is. Um, and we are, um, just so you know, one thing that isn't there currently are any uh, uh, workshops that we are, are, are actually the, um, the host or uh, deliverer of the content itself. It's more like the event information is, is, is from the event organizer and then we're a participant in that, but we do have um, some workshops in, in the works that we will be developing as well and we'll be adding that to, um, to our website. Um, but also we promote it just so you know, uh, Margaret, through our uh, social media um, as well and other communication channels that DCA helps us with. Uh, that'd be great. You can just send, uh, have an email sent to me on that. Uh, on the website though, uh, I think it might be helpful and maybe it's not the kind of thing that students are looking for, but it might be helpful if that was a little easier to locate where it is that sure. upcoming events uh, at least I have difficulty clicking around and not, not getting to it. So thanks. We can work on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and this is Lee. I just had a question about um, the the kind of the miscellaneous student outreach efforts, particularly the schools that were formerly or provisionally accredited by ACICS and the one, for instance, that you mentioned closed. Yeah. Um, because and this is just sort of a coincidence because that's in a service area that I used to do legal services in. Um, I'm curious as, as you're doing that outreach, if there is collaboration or coordination with any of the local legal services organizations to make sure the students do have access to, you know, help there if they need it for student loan defense or anything, federal student loan defense. Yeah, so I, th I think our, our, our working relationship with that community is is evolving and growing. We've been meeting with them quarterly. I think I've reported that on previous mm -hmm. meetings. And so any upcoming events are always agendized in those in those quarterly meetings as well. And we kind of look at each individual event uniquely and you know what what that student need is based on the facts as we know them leading into that closure workshop. Um, for example, we've had the Board of Barber and Cosmetology join us in those those cosmetology closures recently um, in Title IV school closures. We always reach out to the Department of Education and have them involved. And um, yes, um, the, the the legal aid community is 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 aware and looped into our um, uh, uh, outreach development procedures as well as, as something that staff always checks in with. Thank you. Any other committee questions or comment? Very good, we'll go ahead and open for public comment on agenda item 6G, the Office of Student Assistance and Relief. Thank you. We've opened up the WebEx Q&A to facilitate public comment. If you would like to make a comment on the OSAR report, you can click on the question mark, type the word comment in the text box and click send or anyone may raise their hand by clicking on the hand icon and our call-in users can press star three to raise their hand. Each speaker will have three minutes. Are there any comments? I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. We'll move on to agenda item 6H, uh, the report on the student tuition recovery fund. And we've got Yvette Johnson, yep. our administration chief. Good afternoon. Once again, I'm Yvette Johnson, and I am the manager of the student tuition recovery fund unit. Um, the student tuition recovery fund unit is the unit responsible for processing STRIF applications that are received from students who suffered an economic loss 
due to a school closure. Today, I'm going to go over the statistics for the STRIF unit, but first I want to start off with good news, actually great news regarding the STRIF unit. We are now currently fully staffed. Um, the number of staff in the STRIF unit has gone from two to five. Mm -hmm. And with the new staff that's come on board, we're currently going through training. We're refining our processes. We're looking for efficiencies. And we've implemented job shadow, shadowing, peer mentoring, and cross training as well with, within the team. And the team that we have right now, they're an enthusiastic team. They're a great support, support system for each other. And they provide excellent customer service to the students as they navigate through the Strift claim. So I want to say thank you to the team members and for all the work that they do. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So in front of you, you have the current Strift totals for this quarter. Um, we have the first quarter where we received 34 claims within that quarter. And during this quarter, we received 30. And so far for this fiscal year, we received 20, um, claim, 29 claims have been approved so far for this quarter, this past quarter, I'm sorry, as well as we've deemed 13 claims ineligible. We've denied 10 claims. 33 claims were unable to contact. And as you can see, there's a, a large number of claims that were considered to be unable to contact because as part of our cleanup of the claims that we have in-house, we um, we had staff go through their claims that are uh, waiting for a response from the student. And as I've mentioned in previous meetings, the we have a cycle of 30, 60, 90 days where we reach out to the students that are non-responsive to our request for additional information. When the students are non-responsive, we send letters, emails, make phone calls if necessary to try to reach out to that student to get the information we need in order to be able to process their claims. If we don't get a response before closing the claim is unable to contact, we actually do LexisNexis searches as well to see if we can get any more current information. If we are not able to reach out to that student, we do with the last information, contact information we have on file, once again, we'll send it to we'll send a letter email to the student letting them know that we're going to close their claim, but they do have the opportunity to open that claim up at any time um, and provide us with the information necessary for us to continue to process. You can go to the next slide, please. This slide is a breakdown of our current, where our claims currently stand. So under the first section, you see the analyst first review, and that means that the analyst has processed the claim to the, uh, has processed the claim, and then they've put together a summary of what their recommendation is and how they deem the claim should be moved forward. We have claim, um, analyst review, 78 claims are currently under analyst review, and we have 76 claims that are waiting for student responses. And we have 650 claims in the queue. And I have to do another brag on this one. <laughs> From the last report, we had uh, about 700 and I, think, I believe it was 764 claims in the queue. And so just with the addition of that staff, we've been able to actually actively work the queue and bring that number down. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is an account of what we have over this at the state controller's office for payment. Um, for this past quarter, we had $444,105 in claims that were approved and sent over to the um, state controller's office for payment. And so far this quarter, out of that, $220,002.27 and have been paid, and that's 23 claims. And our current STRIF balance as of 12-31-22 is $21,612.06. Um, yeah. <laughs> so 
So um, we are closely monitoring the current shift fund to make sure that we stay within the, the limits. And our last, our last slide is for the large impact closures. And as you can see, we are still moving forward with those large impact closures with the healed wild tech Everest, the Corinthian claims. We're starting to get some traction with those where we're able to process those claims. And um, we're finding that the students are getting their loans discharged. And with that, we were able to actually determine what the economic loss of the student is. And we're able to make payments to the student for their out-of-pocket payments. That concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Any committee questions or comments for Beth? Uh, I have a, just Margaret, I have a couple of questions. On the uh, Teen Tuition Recovery Fund uh, claims chart, which are on ours is page 82, uh, what's the difference between ineligible claims and denied claims? An ineligible claim means that the student does not meet any of the criteria for eligibility for STRIF or filing a STRIF. So say the school is not closed or the, um, they don't have an economic loss. And then the denied is pretty much the same, but the denied is more for they do not have an economic loss. So therefore we have nothing to pay out, but the eligibility means that they don't Ineligibility means that they don't meet any of the criteria for even filing a strip claim. So with that, so on the yeah, on the application, there's a listing of qualifying events. So it means that they don't fall within any of those categories. Got it. Uh, and then the other question I have is, <clears throat> what's the uh, uh, e either median or average time from? Um, filing a complaint to getting that complaint determined? I don't have that information immediately available, but I know you did ask for a timeline in the last meeting, and that is something that we are working on. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other committee questions or comments? All right, we'll go ahead and open for public comment on agenda item 6H, the Student Tuition Recovery Fund. Thank you, and we are opening up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If you've got a comment on the fund, you can look for the question mark icon, type the word comment and click send, or you can raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon and call in users may press star three to raise their hand. Each speaker will have three minutes. Are there any comments? I do not see any requests for comment at this time. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Yvette. It was good to see you. You too. <laughs> All right, that brings us to the end of agenda item six in totality. Debbie, any closing or wrap up thoughts for six before we? Um, yeah, actually, thank you for asking. I, um, I just, you know, upon reflection um, and just hearing everyone's presentation, I feel like it's clear that there is a theme of change throughout a lot of these presentations. Um, I think the team is making um, changes in virtually every area of our work to find efficiencies, improve services. Um, and we're also at the same time working through a lot of staffing changes that are quite significant in some extents. And as, as Daniel, I know mentioned, it's not just even the vacancies and hiring, but also just onboarding and, and getting acclimated. So it's significant. And I want to, I just want to acknowledge that, that is a lot and that the team and certainly the, the folks who are participating in this meeting right now, but also truly the entire staff has just been really doing a phenomenal job and staying focused on the mission and goals and our common purpose. And I'm, and I'm really excited to, see some of that being reflected in these meetings and the meeting materials. Um, certainly we we have a ways to go. Um, and and I think the team is the team that we have right now is just really excited for the challenge and excited to keep moving in the right direction. Great, thank you. Uh, so committee, we're we have 
um, agenda item seven uh, to go through next, and then our just our future agenda items. Uh, I would guess we're maybe 40 minutes or so to completion. And so rather than take a lunch break, I would recommend that we take a 10 minute break. Uh, and if you need to grab a quick snack or something, that's maybe enough time to do that. So we can do restroom break and snacks and then power on because we should be able to finish around one o'clock if we take a 10 minute break. Uh, anybody with on the committee want to have a concern with that or express concern there or support? This is Tess. That sounds perfect. I do have a hard stop at one o'clock, so I just wanted to make the group aware of that. OK, thanks, Tess. And we will, OK, and we will still have a quorum then. Margaret, you think that schedule sounds good? Yep, sounds good. Great, so let's take a 10 minute break. We'll reconvene at, at 1225 and carry on with the agenda. Thank you.
All right, it is uh, 12.25, and we'll do a quick uh, roll call to determine that we have our, our, our committee back together. Margaret, are you here? Yes, hi. Hi. Uh, Robert? Yes, I'm here. Great, thank you. And Kansen? Here. And Melanie? I'm here. Thank you, Tess? Yes, I'm here, thank you. Lee? I am here. <coughs> Excellent, thanks. And Kevin, are you back? I'm here. Perfect. And Debbie, you're here? Yes, I'm here. Great. Thank you all for the quick break and appreciate the flexibility. We'll move on with agenda item seven, uh, which we, we're going to take in two letters. Uh, the first being a group of status updates on uh, uh, various uh, language that's working its way through the system. Great. I'll turn it over to David Dumble for that. Uh, hello, I'm David Dumble. I'm the Regulations Manager uh, here at the Bureau, and I am pleased to start my presentation by announcing that the four regulatory proposals that the Bureau submitted to the Office of Administrative Law in late 2022 have all been approved. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. Uh, the uh, repeal of ability to benefit language proposal was approved on January 27th and will become effective uh, on April 1st. The exemption for programs under three to hours and the proposal adopting three new substantive change reporting requirements were both approved on February 10th and will go into effect also on April 1st. The out of state registration and re-registration proposal was approved on February 10th and was made effective upon filing. Uh, we are currently working with DCA's Office of Informational Services to post the new form on our website as soon as possible. Uh, for all these proposals, guidance from the Bureau will be forthcoming soon. Um, if you include the AB 1340 regulations that were adopted in July, this will mean that the Bureau had five regulatory proposals approved by o OAL in calendar year 2022. Are there any questions? Is there any meaning to the yellow or green in your color coding on the final date? Um, that was probably done uh, at the time when uh, before things were finalized and it was anticipated that he'd be approved, but we, uh, uh, by the time we had to submit this form for posting, uh, it was not all completed. So we, we, we left it uh, with different colors, but uh, they are all approved. Um, Committee members, any other questions uh, on the regulatory package tracker? I would also, can I just jump in real quick, Dave, just to also point out um, that just to make sure you take a look at the rest of the other items, because it does sort of um, foreshadow some of the conversations we're anticipating having on the regulatory front in future meetings. Yeah, we have a, a five approved this year. We have eight on deck for next uh, for this year. Uh, so we're trying to be a little more ambitious. Um, um, so. Um, We'll take those as they come, but for right now, this is what we're anticipating uh, working on for the upcoming year. And the, the advisory committee meeting column there, that is our singular opportunity to, to provide feedback for the language, right? Once it moves, once the train leaves this station, then we can't affect change after that point. That is when it was when we intend going to the advisory committee and formally presenting the proposal uh, as developed. Um, and uh, uh, as you can see, we're spreading these out through the year. Uh, uh, five was something of a haul this year, but I think we can do eight next year if we spread them out and start some of them late enough in 2023 that they'll become effective in 2024, uh, but we can get the ball rolling uh, this year. And we as the committee can use this. This is your current guess of when we're going to be able to see it. So in our May meeting, we'll look at the person in control and signature requirements, for example. Yes, uh, if, if all goes according to plan, um, this is what this is how we plan on rolling, rolling the uh, uh, future proposals out. Well, pretty much everything goes according to plan, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh. 
Um, I will also just say, um, you know, I think we have structured it this way, and I know this is a change. This has not always been the way that the Bureau has approached these meetings and these discussions. Um, I think the current team finds it probably particularly helpful to get early input when things are being shaped, and then and then we can kind of continue to use that input to massage how things move forward in the in the lengthy and um, extensive process in the meantime. So I think for from where from our standpoint, that is the most um, crucial time to get the committee's feedback. Um, there is, of course, always a comment period at the end, and um, committee members, as well as anyone else in the public, are you know, certainly welcome to submit comments, um, and then there are other opportunities to make changes later. Um, okay, but, um, before I move on, are we stopping for public comments now, or can I complete the uh, entire presentation? Um, um, will you be moving to the specific regulatory proposal on date of closure next? Uh, actually, uh, next. I'm oh, going you're to... still on status updates. Yeah, yeah. Let's seven. As long as you're in seven A, we'll we'll do. You're all still in seven A. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just before proceeding, I will. Uh, uh, I mentioned this before at previous meetings. Uh, in July of last year, the Department of Consumer Affairs rolled out a new regulatory procedure, uh, re regulatory process. And so this is the first time uh, we're actually going through this new process. All of our previous. Uh, proposals were underway uh, uh, when that was announced. And so we are sort of starting a new process and we're feeling our way a little bit, but so far it seems uh, uh, positive. And what I want to talk about next is um, that what's listed as five substantive change approval method for instructional delivery. That is actually uh, the substantive change for distance educational learning management system proposal. Uh, it implements 94894L of the Act, and this was discussed in the November Advisory Committee. Um, and per the new uh, regulatory process at DCA, uh, we held a what's called a kickoff meeting, which is a meeting with bureau personnel and DCA staff and regulatory attorneys, legal, uh, fiscal. Uh, and following the kickoff meeting, uh, we submitted the first draft of the text to DCA uh, regulatory um, for review in early February, and we should be getting their feedback on that sometime in early March. Uh, the time frame is listed as 30 days in the um, process. So that is where that stands at this point in time. Um, are there any questions? If not, I will go on to the um, next item. You can go to the next slide. Um, let's, actually, David, let's let's back up one. Let's go ahead okay. and take, we'll take a public comment for the totality of 7A, which is the status updates on all of the pending regulatory language. Uh, but before before public comment, uh, committee members, any uh, questions, comments, or feedback on 7A, uh, one through five. Okay, uh, Anne, would you help us go to public comment then for seven agenda item 7A? Of course, and we've opened up the uh, public comment feature of WebEx, the Q&A. If you would like to make a comment on 7A, the status updates, you can look for the question mark icon, type the word comment in that text box and click send, or anyone may raise their hand by clicking on the hand icon, and our call-in users may press star three to raise their hand. Each speaker will have three minutes. And I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to agenda item 7B, and that is the regulatory proposal for uh, date of closure. Um, thank you. I'm going to uh, sort of walk through the draft um, text as we have it currently. And then after I finish, uh, Scott, I'll turn it over to Scott Valverde, who is going to discuss uh, the issues that are in the uh, uh, memo that is in the meeting materials. Uh, and the text of this is also includes, included in the meeting materials if you want to follow along. And just for efficiency, I think it might be um, uh, quicker if, if you have any questions to hold them off and address them to Kevin uh, when he takes, uh, takes over after I finish. So looking at the... Um, we can go ahead a couple of slides. 
to the to the text of the uh, proposal. Yeah, I guess it's not in the slide. Okay. I think it's not. Yeah, but I think folks it's need to look at the meeting materials. Yeah, you look at the meeting materials and, and follow along. And uh, this is a two part. Uh, we're doing seven six two zero zero, which is the current uh, uh, regulation regarding school closure. And here is um, how we are amending it. First, we are setting up a definition of what is an authorized school representative and the um, list of uh, titles we have, an owner, person in control, chief academic officer, chief executive officer, chief operating officer, institution director, or any person delegated by any of the aforementioned persons. Uh, that list is already in statute in uh, regulation. It's in 75010C. And we felt that uh, in dealing with school closure, we wanted to make sure we were dealing with somebody in a position of authority to speak for the institution and not whoever happened to you know, pick up the phone when we, we happened to call. So uh, we felt that uh, having a, uh, uh, established a definition of who was authorized to speak for the school was important. Um, we also added the fact that the school closure plan now required to be submitted, has to be submitted under penalty of perjury. We added that uh, to protect the school. Uh, if the school is in the process of closing or preparing to close, there might be some disgruntled employees uh, still on the premises, and we wanted to discourage anyone uh, wanting to submit any inaccurate information to the Bureau uh, on their way out the door. Um, uh, currently, the, the current uh, uh, regulation asks for schools to provide um, uh, an uh, exact, date of, uh, exact date of closure and the last date of instruction. Um, we have decided that we are defining the last uh, date of instruction as the date of closure, unless the bureau sees an alternate date that is more appropriate for some certain under some circumstances. So that is why we are changing that language there to specify that the closing date will be the last date of instruction. Um, then below in in uh, A three, um, the um, we are making some changes here. It uh, the current regulation. Uh, asked for a list of students who uh, enrolled 60 days prior to enrollment, which does not quite conform to the definition of, enroll, of eligibility for STRIF. And so we are linking those two together by putting a reference in to 94923, which is the STRIF eligibility uh, statute. And we are also asking that in addition to add, add, providing us with just a list of students, we are asking for all student level information that is, they are already provided, already required to um, uh, keep under uh, 76140. Uh, that's to provide the Bureau with some contact information instead of just a list of names. So if the uh, OSAR needs to contact students about their SPRIF uh, uh, possible eligibility, we'll have that contact information available to us. And lastly, on A, um, in, in or excuse me, in uh, B, um, there is a notice requirement that schools have to give to students, and we are adding the requirement that it be in writing and the copy be submitted to the Bureau. Uh, we've had some instances in the past where we've tried to verify the, the notice, and we were told that the notice was given verbally, uh, which means we can't verify that it actually happened or that the contents were accurate. So that's why we're making that change in, in C. And that is what we are amending in uh, uh, the first part of the regulation. The second part is a new uh, provision, 76245. And this is uh, the details of selecting the date of closure where a school does not provide one. Um, and let me... Um, and then uh, what, uh, what we are doing in the first part here is uh, establishing that if the Bureau believes that a school is closed for whatever reason, the Bureau will conduct an investigation based on communication or lack thereof with the institution and the Bureau, as well as the institution's communications with students, accreditors, and other government regulators. In the event that the Bureau determines that an institution is a closed institution, the Bureau will send a notice to the institution informing them of the Bureau's finding and asking them asking an authorized school representative reply under penalty of perjury and confirm that either the school is still open or that the school has in fact closed and to provide a closure date. 
if the institution does not respond to the notice, then the Bureau will declare the institution to be closed and, es and establish a closure date that will either be the last date of instruction, or if that cannot be determined, then the date 30 days after the issuance of the notice. And one last item is the Bureau may also initiate an investigation into a school's closure status if the school fails to apply for a renewal in a timely fashion. And at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Scott Valverde, who will discuss some of the issues that are included in the memo that is in the meeting materials. Thanks, David. A rare you get to hear from Scott twice in one meeting, Meeting, so I don't know if that's a, a good thing or a bad thing, but it is what it is. So uh, thanks for your um, work on that, David. So. Uh, as, he, as he mentioned, um, in your packet, uh, you have a memo that we provided that uh, kind of provides an overview of the of the um, sort of underlying issue and the, and the statute that was in 1433 that that has led us to this proposed regulatory framework. So hopefully you've had a chance uh, to re to review that. Um, we sort of recount that um, and, and remind you all of Lisa Refredi's prior presentation. Um, last year on sort of the different types of, of closures uh, that we that we face and process and the associated uh, challenges and costs with 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 processing those closures. Um, that was kind of like the entree into this discussion. And then um, in November, uh, I, I believe it was David who had highlighted, you know, in his presentation that you know, that this was a, a new section in law that goes into effect January went into effect now January one and um, and was an issue that would likely require uh, regulation. Um, and so so here we are, it's a continuation of those last two uh, meetings, uh, uh, discussion topics. So uh, we've also included in the memo the, the, the language of the new, um, the new statutory language itself that establishes three things. You know, one that um, a school's approval terminates automatically upon the school closing. Two, that if a school does not provide a closure date, then the Bureau shall, keyword there, um, select one. And that's the area that we're zeroing in on in today's uh, presentation in this particular proposed reg. Um, and then thirdly, that the terminated license shall not be uh, reinstated. So those are all new provisions that came in January 1. So in preparation for the statute coming into effect, we went back and we looked at a whole host of several past uh, problematic closures um, that we've processed uh, in terms of specific issues that we've had with identifying closure dates and, um, you know, keeping in the back of our mind one of the impacts that's significant that David had mentioned, you know, the the direct impact on 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 that date as it relates to SRIF eligibility. And so the, the more time and, and struggle that we have establishing that date, the longer it takes to establish what, what the actual SRIF eligibility window is. So that being one of, of, of several several issues. But um, so we went back and we looked at several of those scenarios. Uh, we had situations in the past where, again, schools did not provide a closure date, uh, but we, we were informed by other parties or through other sources or other information that the school had closed. Uh, that's included but not limited to the Bureau uh, making that discovery and, and showing up for inspections or site visits in a school has, has closed being one example of many. Uh, we had examples where we had multiple dates that were provided by the school, uh, depending on who we were talking to or in what correspondence they were providing to whom. Uh, we had uh, dates that were provided by an unauthorized contact at the school. So again, David mentioned uh, the uh, disgruntled employee, um, but we've had, you know, those and faculty or, you know, it's a husband wife ownership and, you know, one, one gives us one date and the other gives us another date for, for whatever reason. Um, we also had conflicting dates, even from outside, you know, sources, you know, like where the accreditor, the school was t told they didn't give us a date, but they gave the accreditor one date. But for whatever reason, U.S. Department of Education may have another date that they have as the last day of instruction or another uh, governmental agency that may be involved may have been provided with another date. So we had like real tangible, specific examples of all of those. Um, that hopefully you know this this section and and the subsequent regulation will will hopefully uh, remedy uh, given given again those those issues that are related to uh, struggling to establish a closure date. So uh, we did several things in preparation for this. We've looked at the existing 
closed school processing procedures and how in the past, in the absence of this statute and these regulations, how decisions were made uh, to ultimately land on a closure date. Um, we looked at other states. Um, Debbie really helped us with that in terms of connecting with other states, uh, policies and definitions of, of closures and things like that. Um, we also looked at, uh, uh, talked to the U.S. Department of Education about how they handle this situation. It's also high stakes for them with the closed school uh, discharge date as well, and they've, they've faced similar challenges. So uh, they also are looking forward to us, um, you know, come, hopefully coming up with some solutions. So a lot of legwork in terms of, um, you know, preparing for what we would anticipate um, based on past experiences and hopefully a regulatory framework that, that addresses some of those things. I want to, at that point, kind of stop and and thank uh, Meg Christian, who is uh, um, one of, is our closed school uh, analyst, and I've been working with her very closely on this process. She's processed a lot of these closures, done a lot of the deep dive and fact finding on these prior closures, and so I appreciate all of her hard work on that as well. So David kind of went over the proposed language. Essentially, the framework, as he mentioned, was. First, start about starting by defining who actually is an authorized school representative specifically for the purpose of notifying the Bureau of a closure. So who has the authority to do that, since that has been one of the challenges. Um, and in situations where we ha uh, have you know, reason to believe the schools closed, but have unable to receive a closure date from the authorized school representative, then we send this newly developed letter that the proposed reg speaks to. Um, and if we receive no response within 30 days, then uh, we select the closure date um, as per 94926.5b. So we also propose uh, to define that uh, that closure date uh, to include language that includes the last date of instruction um, clause, if you will. Again, that's uh, other states use that commonly. The U.S. Department of Education uses that. But um, quickly here, we're gonna we're gonna switch over to asking you all for feedback. So. Um, so that's one of the things that we're, we're, we're seeking your feedback on is, is that definition of a closure date. So in doing this, we have identified uh, specific, uh, I think one, two, three, four, five specific areas or questions where we would hope to have your feedback. Hopefully you had a chance again to review this in advance. Uh, Chair Holt, this is kind of where we kind of flip into meeting procedure. Um, I don't know, I, I, my proposal would be to read one and then pause and then gather any feedback uh, that the committee members may have on that particular question and then go through question by question as opposed to just uh, reading them all and having you do general feedback, but I'm open to however you want to do it. Um, I, my suggestion would be having had an opportunity to review it in advance that uh, maybe we member by member go through um, points that we have and then sure. You can keep score on your list of open questions, and if you don't get any immediate feedback, I have some notes, for example, that I could share, and I'm, I'm sure Margaret or others might as well. Um, Works for me. And then you can go through the questions if you're lacking direction on those. Okay. Uh, so having mentioned that, I can start with a, a, a couple points here. I believe you uh, support the definition of authorized school representative. I think it's strong also that it's used elsewhere, uh, so that I I'm, would speak in support of. Um, I have deep concern about the language um, having a closure plan signed under penalty of perjury. And it's really, I guess, a question, which is a plan like perjury is uh, obviously an established legal standard where you're saying something is true and it's not true or you're, you're basically making a, a false statement. And because much of what is included in a closure plan for a school is perspective. They are just that. They are plans for something that we expect to do in the future, plan on doing. I'm not sure how you would apply a, a perjury standard um, to whether some, that was what we wanted to happen, but that didn't in fact happen. Did, did that person then perjure themselves because they didn't follow through with the plan that they had, which is a, a whole different uh, kettle of fish, if you will, right? So if they make a statement and say, this is what has been true, or we did this, or we did that, and it's an untrue statement, you'd be able to apply that standard, but I don't know how you apply that meaningfully to something that they plan on doing months from now. So I would urge for legal clarification or, or move to strike on, on that element because you're, again, looking at something prospective. Uh, 
defining the closure date, I think last date of instruction is is very strong. I, I think I would support everything else in the memo. My other concern area is uh, under it's uh, two under point two seven six two four five C. Uh, the discretion for the bureau to independently determine an institution is closed if the institution fails to submit a timely renewal application. I believe is highly problematic in the absence of any other stand any other definition. So, um, just having been through the annual report we were talking about earlier, we have some unknown number of institutions that haven't filed their annual report. Or you could have an institution that doesn't submit their timely renewal application. Does that mean the bureau has? discretion on the day after a renewal application has been received to say, oh, well, then you're closed. That seems like a lot of uh, latitude on the part of uh, the Bureau. Um, I understand, my, I would think what you're getting at there is schools that you, they haven't done it for some extended period of time. You know, they're a year past due or, or a, an extremely long period of time. And you're just trying to clear up the decks because nobody thinks that's a school anymore. It was just like ghost walking on. Um, but I, I think as written, it, it's too threatening to say if your application for renewal is late, then you're closed. And that's the feedback that I have on the memo. In that model, committee members, any other, having read the memo in advance, does anybody else have points that they, talking points that they've already developed before we dig into the questions? Oh. You want to just make points and then go to the questions, is what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I see. I misunderstood. Okay. So those are those are the notes that I had made, and so okay. I wanted to share those. I that, have in part, in part because one of the two of two, neither of those are addressed in the questions, Scott. Right? Is the reason I am proposing that? What are our initial thoughts, and right. then we can dig into the questions. Uh, I, I have a question, and that is, I thought David said that authorized representative is defined in regulation such and such and I didn't catch what such and such was that it's already defined or you're yeah, that was it was in uh 75010c say that again please 750 7510c c Okay. Maybe the defined is it defined there or is it just used? That's an example of that same it, list of individuals. Yeah. Uh, it's used there. That is the list of persons who are authorized to accept a notice to comply if a compliance inspection finds minor violations. But it's not defined. Uh, th that is the list of uh, personnel that is used in 75010C for that purpose. I don't, don't know if it's that counts as a definition or or not. Seven zero. Sorry, one. Uh, okay, uh, I'll take a look at that while the others are talking. But uh, I, things that are not specifically in the questions, then I guess is what your uh, Joseph suggested. Um, um, this is something that is not in you know, anything that you, you are putting in new, but while you're fixing things up uh, in uh, section 76240, uh, looks like that is A, uh, A4B. So on my copy, it's the top of page 93, uh, which talks about um, the institution, for the institution uh, arrangements for making refunds and returning federal student financial aid program funds. Uh, I was thinking it might be helpful to add in accordance with federal regulations, although they that may be superfluous, but just a possibility. Um, then in 76245A, uh, if the re Bureau has reason to believe that an improved institution that has not submitted notice of closure, uh, you say has ceased operations. I think that what you want to say here is has ceased offering educational programs because the uh, to operate is defined and it may be a little broader than what you're intending to say here. So I think what you want to say here has, since you're defining it as the last day of instruction, it seems to me rather than ceased operations, you want to say ceased offering programs or 
stop, you know, let, stop providing instruction, something like that. That's a little more specific. Um, in, um, and then in uh, 76245B, um, you say that if the school doesn't respond to the notice sent, then the Bureau um, declares it's closed as of the last date of instruction, or if that cannot be determined, the date 30 days after the notice. This is critical for uh, people who might qualify for closed school uh, discharge or um, for a refund under STRIF, depending on your time period, how far back it might go. Uh, it seems to me that if you send them a notice, you have some indication that they have closed, even though they haven't told you that. So that I would think that the date of closure should be the date you send the notice. You give them 30 days to respond, and if they don't respond, then the date that you sent the notice uh, is should be considered the date of closure. Because otherwise, you're you're putting 30 days on there and reducing the period during which the student would be able to claim uh, a discharge. I hope that makes sense. Uh, and as far as the uh, failing to submit the timely renewal application, um, it seems to me that I am assuming that there are standard uh, notices that the Bureau is sending out reminding schools. And if you don't have it closed on that day, you are in effect letting the school continue to operate without any authorization. Uh, if they submit their application before the final date, then they can continue to operate. So all they have to do is, you know, submit their application one day before they're supposed to, their old one ends. It seems to me that that's not a particularly difficult standard, uh, especially if there is some kind of automatic notice thing going out. I don't know if there is, uh, but but it seems to me that otherwise you wind up with the school continue to operate without having any information at the Bureau about its um, its plans. Um, and then um, let's see, I think that on the on the regulatory language itself, I think that was it. Uh, one potential lens, uh, um, Debbie or Scott, to look look at um, regarding the point that Margaret and I just made in regards to the renewal application is look at your real live data in the last five years, how many schools have submitted a late renewal application and imagine a world in which you closed all of them. Like, does that does that make sense? I don't, and I honestly don't know, like, uh, you know, our institutions and probably most or all don't don't submit late, you know, renewal applications, but I'm just concerned for small operators if there isn't a, a if there isn't a robust system for communicating with them they might not it's not top of their radar they don't have a dedicated compliance person they're a sole proprietorship running a school and they didn't remember they were supposed to submit it in october and they have students and everything else you know going to school there so closing it would be more disruptive than simply helping this helping the school submit their renewal application yeah, just to clarify on that point, uh, we're not saying the school would be closed at that point. We're saying that that would trigger a bureau starting the investigation process and following the process to determine if they are in fact closed or not. They wouldn't be just automatically closed if they failed to get a renewal application in on time. So the language says explicitly that the bureau may independently determine the institution is closed if the institution fails to submit a timely renewal application. It may determine if the institution is closed. It's not saying it is closed. It may, in, 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 the intent was to yes. say, initiate the investigative process. Okay, so maybe, yeah, maybe I'd maybe clarify that then. Yep. We'll it certainly take, this, we'll take a look at this language, but I, just a point of clarification, I, I can confirm that we do send multiple letters to um, an institution before their approval expires. Yep. I, I do know that I know that we are coming up right at one o'clock and I know that Tess had said she was going to need to hop off. It looks like maybe she already 
did. I just wanted to see if she had any comments before she did, but I think we might have already lost her. Yeah, that's a good point. Sorry, I missed that, Debbie. So, um, committee members, anybody else that has prepared notes um, it, from their advanced review before we dig into the questions listed? Okay. So, Scott, thanks for your, and Debbie, your, your patience in addressing those notes first. And then, um, your, so your first question is whether the definition of school closure, uh, whether it's necessary, and how right. schools that don't meet the definition uh, should be treated. Correct. Yeah. So we have, you know, we're proposing a definition of an authorized school representative and a closure date. And there's an existing definition of a closed institution, which isn't very helpful because it just says a school that has closed. So the, the missing or potential missing piece, again, this is what we're seeking your feedback on, is the actual definition of a closure itself is, is something that, that, that we were, you know, struggling with, you know, you know, how do we, should we include that? Do we need to include that? And again, it raised questions like the one that we pose, which are uh, a, a, a real time um, problem or real time issue that we're facing, which are schools who met the definition of a private post-secondary institution in California, and then by moving out of state or otherwise reorganizing no longer meet that definition. And there's sort of like an in-house question about processing that as a, as a closure or not. And would that be, would that situation be encapsulated within a definition of a school closure? Um, so yes, that's the question. Yeah, well, I, I know certainly from the department's perspective, an institution that moves outside of California uh, or even in, in the accreditor's eye, that wouldn't, that's not tantamount to closure. So the ability of the college to school to restructure and to no longer follow under the Bureau's jurisdiction, uh, again, isn't, isn't equal to, to closure. So I think they are distinct instances. Well, on that point, I'm wondering, uh, uh, what is there about that that would uh, need to be treated as a closed school. I'm not quite understanding, I guess, the, the relationship of that circumstance, moving out of state or reorganizing to closure. Um, I would say the, 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 the processes that we do to process a, a, a school closure, a school closure packet with a custodian of records, a plan for the disposition of those records, how California students would be able to access those uh, records, um, you know, what, where, whether California students were given an opportunity to continue on uh, in the in the program, um, or were the, was there any student impact in general? I think would be a question. Uh, if, if if a school came to us and said that they were, you know, this is why we no longer meet the definition of a private post secondary institution in California. Therefore, we no longer need your approval, but we have students, or 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 the, that would be the question: Is there a student impact in that in that? Um, incident where if we defined it as a closure and had them go through the closed school process, then we would require the school to, to speak to those things and, and respond to those issues. Well, under if they are currently under, they are required to be approved in order to make any uh, substantial changes, which I think what you're talking about would be considered substantial change. They would either have to get accrediting agency approval if they're approved by accreditation or bureau approval if they're not. So how they couldn't even do that until they went through that process. Or I guess they don't care because since they don't intend to be under the bureau, who cares whether they're abiding by the bureau uh, requirements uh, unless you had some authority to whack them with a fine if they didn't uh, comply with that. Uh, I guess I'm a little confused about how the post, it seems like there needs to be a process as you're indicating. I just don't, I'm not quite sure I understand how it would be the closed school process. Many members, any other feedback on the first bullet point? Okay, moving on to the second point, uh, defining who qualifies as an authorized school representative. I, and as I mentioned, I, I support the current definition. Committee members, or the proposed definition, I should say. Committee members, any other feedback on that language? Yeah, I do. Uh, there is no definition in the in the regs. I just took a look at that, and that 
language is used just in order to say who the bureau can notify. It doesn't say who the school is supposed to have notify. The school, when they apply, is supposed to designate an institutional representative under 71160. And as far as I can tell, there is no requirement for them to update that. But uh, I, I think that the definition, the authorized representative defini definition here does not cure one of the problems that um, was mentioned of uh, getting different information from different individuals at the school, all of whom are authorized. So it wouldn't really cure that problem. Uh, what I'm thinking about an institution representative, I think the Bureau has power under uh, I don't have it in front of me, but the Bureau has power to require any additional reports it needs to ensure compliance with the statute. So I'm wondering if under that provision of the law or elsewhere, the Bureau would have authority to require institutions to keep their institution representative designation updated. Uh, and that then you can just use that definition. The institution representative is whoever the school identified. And that's the person it has to come from and have a requirement that they have to keep that current so that then if you get it from that person, then it's official. And if you don't get it from that person, either they need to then update their designation, give you an official, yes, here, this is the person, even though it's not the one we had five years ago when we applied, or it's not considered an authentic um, notice from the school. Yeah, the only other thought I have for, um, but I think it only applies to the type for institutions, would be who's authorized to sign the EAP or the ECAR, like who are the authorized signatories for an institution. Um, but you have private businesses in California that are don't participate in Title IV, many of your approved schools, so they, I don't even know that they have an equivalent standard for that. Committee, any other feedback on Authorized representative. Move into the third bullet, specifying what constitutes closure date, last date of instruction. Um, I think that makes the most sense to me. It's most consistent with the Department of Education standard as well. Any other committee feedback on the date of closure? Um, I just wanted to mention, I kind of seconding, I think what Margaret said earlier, um, that I think the last date of instruction makes sense when that's when that specified date is unavailable, though. I do have a concern about having it be 30 days after the notice is sent because there is that 120 day look back for the students. Um, and so I would encourage. I don't know what the right answer is, whether to make to provide the notice and then if there is no response to have that closure date be the date of the notice. I mean, I think that would be maybe the ideal. Um, <clears throat> but also, I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I think that there's you could imagine sort of the cascade of horribles or the worst case scenario where, you know, a school somehow hasn't been operating for a, a couple months or something, but nobody noticed for whatever reason or it hadn't been reported or something like that. So I I think it's I know we need to come up with a rule and it, and so some people are going to get left out as a result of that. But I think that is, a, I would at least err on the side of pushing that 30 days back to the date of the notice if there's no response. Yeah, I, I, so I support that as well. If there's no response using the, the original date of the notice. Now, based on what Lee said, I'm thinking, yeah, if the Bureau doesn't know about it for a couple of months, the date of the notice is going to be two months late. Uh, I presume that one thing is the Bureau could specify if if it has information that the school closed at an earlier date in its notice saying we have information that the school stopped offering classes on such and such a date, uh, which we will take as the date of closure unless you notify us otherwise. I mean, that's another way to handle it. Or if the school, if the Bureau doesn't have a specific date, then it would be just the date of the notice. Yeah, it's a tough one because schools don't necessarily have uh, continuously offer instruction. They might have not have students for a season and then have students again uh, in future. So retroactively applying a closure date for a school that wasn't closed, they were operating, they were still recruiting students, but hadn't started a new cohort, for example. Right. I mean, I must, when I'm saying they have information that they weren't offering, I'm assuming it would be the kind of thing where a student calls up to 
Osar and says, you know, hey, I tried to get into my class today. It's, you know, we're in midterm and I can't get in. Close, the yeah. And this, the bureau based on, so bureau based on other information could say, we have information that this is the date, you know. So I, I think it could be done. It probably needs to be fleshed out a little bit more. Um, but I think that, you know, the, certainly the bureau could consider, you know, reports by students of being locked out, uh, contact with, you know, somebody who's supposed to be representing the school um, and see what's going on. If they have any, you know, can contact them or the landlord or, you know, anything like that, uh, that might give them some idea, which they could then determine, well, this is the date that we, we think it probably closed. And unless we hear from you differently with better information, you know, this is a date that will determine. Uh, so please let us know what kind of thing. And that's actually, it looks like that is actually contemplated in B, right? Because it does say um, the bro shall declare the institution to be closed as of the di last date of instruction or if that date cannot be determined. So theoretically, if a student called OSAR and said, you know, on March 15th, and but the notice didn't go out till, you know, May 15th or whatever, they right. could determine that that last date of instruction to be March 15th. March, so, right. Yeah, so right. I, th I think that that is contemplated in the regs. Um, I, I So I'm okay with that, but I still would just push that 30 days to be the 30, the, that date of the notice. notice. Yeah. And then the fourth bullet, um, I think we've already had a pretty good discussion about what other factors. The that, that, yeah, actually, can I provide a little clarification to that, yeah. too, at least what I, what I was hoping to get. So really what, what I was hoping to get there is in, in uh, 76245A at the beginning when we're talking about uh, we believe this institution is closed, and so now we're going to make a determination uh, based on. And so we've come up with this list basically being uh, their failure to respond to communications, information from students, accreditors, and and relative governmental agencies. That's kind of like based on on past experiences, what we think to be the, like the most uh, common sources of information we've got externally from a non-school representative that could be valid, you know, as a determiner of, of, of that date. Just want to make sure we didn't miss anything there or are we thinking of because again this is being called out in regs kind of like for the first time um i mean i guess we could always have an included but not limited to kind of statement but i'm just wondering if there was uh, uh anyone else you think that we should consider in the process of determining the date i think what you could do or not have to i'm included but not limited to but similar to that would be or uh other reliable source or other source that Bureau considers uh, reliable. And that way you've kind of covered a contingency if there's like a sheriff that calls up and say, hey, what's going on? Uh, these people are trying to break in and they say that, you know, it was a school and they were just trying to get their books back or something like that, you know, that could be a, a reliable source too, uh, indicating the school is closed. But uh, so something along those lines might uh, cover that unknown factor, but still be limited. So it's not just, you know, anybody at, under the sun says, hey, they're closed. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's covered under relevant government agencies, um, and and that uh, I support the list that you have there, Scott. I don't. I, don't, I can't think. Sorry, of for, for example, not the sheriff, but some other reliable person oh. <laughs> gives you the information. Uh, probably, probably wouldn't happen, but it doesn't doesn't hurt to have that because you always wind up with that odd situation you're not expecting, and then you know you're not able to deal with it. Well, it could be an advocate, right? It could be someone who's working with students or, you know, a local community person. So like, I, I agree. I think it makes sense to to give yourself that little bit of leeway, um, but but to identify, to name the three, because those are the most likely, right? Based on what you all have, have experienced. Correct. That, that, that's where it came from was our, our, our deep dive into the research of, of, of prior closure. So I called up and said, my students tell me the school is closed. She would be a reliable source for you to then look into it, right? Well, I, I would disagree, actually, in the sense that a student can be an unreliable witness. So you can look at the number of complaints, for example, that are right, right. I'm not saying sufficient evidence. Yeah. I'm not saying any of these people are reliable. I'm just saying if you include somebody else, oh. you want that other person to be a reliable source. Yeah. yeah, I hear you. It's good that you get to sort out all this feedback, guys. It's <laughs> meaningful language. <laughs> And then finally, the uh, fifth bullet is how to manage situations oh. where the closure date is inconsistent with established facts uh, and or harmful to student rights. Can you give us some color around that? 
Sure. Yeah, this is one that's really not uh, um, contemplated, um, but but we're asking whether it should be, and that is that we do have an authorized school representative who gives us a closure date. So therefore, the provi new provisions of 1433 really wouldn't apply, right? Because they have the institution has provided a date to us. But again, we have based on experience and past cases and 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 just our work in this space has led us to many situations where um, that was not consistent with all the other information we had, <laughs> you know, so so they're an authorized school representative, but all of the students are all telling us and giving us emails and letters showing that they were notified that the school actually closed, you know, two months earlier um, or or information from, an, again, another outside governmental agency that says that they were notified of the closure as of this date, which is not consistent with what the now authorized school representative is telling us, and it did, could potentially uh, be harmful to students in the ways that we talked about the closed school discharge window, the strip window, um, just other other reasons, you know, that they've got a, a um, I don't know, a certificate of completion at a time that that the school told us the school's closed, you know what I mean? So, so how and should we try to address that in this package as well is, is an open question. So in that in, in that situation, is an in, an institution is telling you that their closure date is a date different than and later than the last date of instruction, right? Right. I would say it's a little not exactly, but a little bit along the lines of what happened with like the, the what the Department of Education did with Corinthian, right? Where like they 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 had their their official closure date, but then they extended the closed school, school discharge period of time. So I don't know if there is any sort of authorization off the top of my head that would allow the Bureau to do something similar to essentially modify the closure date or amend the, right. you know, the protections. But I, I think that's relevant. I, I think it is more of an extreme circumstance, to be very honest. Like, I think, you know, you're not going to ho hopefully, fingers crossed for all of us, that that doesn't happen very frequently. Um, but I think it's worth ensuring that the Bureau has the authority to do that if that can be done through these regulations. That's the part I'm not totally sure of. I was one, thing, one aspect I would, if I could just jump in with just a, just a little bit more color kind of on some of the things. I think, I think um, some of the issues that are important that we've been thinking about are areas where the timeliness of a particular action or something, right. some step that an institution has to take is actually relevant. Um, so for instance, maybe an institution's annual fee is due on September 1st. Um, and so then they tell us they closed in August um, so that they don't have to pay that the fee or, um, or, you know, timely, you know, in terms of an orderly closure, there's a timeliness component to that, right? And we need some notice in advance. So um, maybe an institution um, maybe we're hearing from students that the institution stopped offering instruction, but they're actually telling us that they closed 45 days from, they're closing 45 days in advance. So that way they look like they're reporting a timely closure. I think so. So I think often it's about how do we, how does a, how does particular timely requirements play into what is happening on the ground level? I appreciate that, Debbie. That's a much, much better example than the, than the ones I gave. So. Yes, thank you. Yeah, the only counsel I would have really with that is to use as the secure foundation that last day of instruction and how can you best determine through what's your most reliable determination of the last day of instruction and peg, peg everything on that. So if an institution says, no, I didn't close, I stopped teaching on X date, but I didn't close until Y date, then that's not a valid closure date because you stopped offering instruction on X date. And so use that as your gold standard and then whatever most reliable forms of evidence you have to support that last day of instruction. I, I, I think that's correct. And also, I mean, uh, if a school is giving you wrong information, uh, it's a violation of 94897 of prohibited business practices. Uh, I think it's J3, they're off they make any untrue or misleading change or statement related to uh, any other record or document required by this chapter or by the Bureau. So I think that's also just a little added uh, ability for you to say um, that you can rely on that rather than what the institution tells you. You can rely, I mean, the institution tells you something that's obviously not true. I mean, your standard is 
the date that they stopped uh, the last day of instruction. Instruction, the right. Institution right. tells you. So I think so, but th saying that, I think maybe I, I, I need to look at the regulatory proposed language again. I think you may need to revise that slightly to take care of that. I'm wondering if in um, 76245A2, confirm that the institution has closed and provide a closure date, which shall be the last date of instruction or something like that. So that that gives the institution guidance as to what that closure, if, if that's the standard that you're identifying as the right, right thing, then you can, because because it doesn't talk about the last date of instruction in A, it only talks about it in B. Right. So if you just added that in there on two on A2, it might help. Yeah, it certainly guards against what Debbie was talking about, about the, you know, that, uh, well, we know that we need to give them this date so that we can meet the requirements of an orderly closure. You know, you, you can't manipulate it if it's the last date of instruction, right? It's just, it's a date determined. So yeah, I appreciate that, Leah. That's a good idea. Committee, any other feedback on this topic in total before we go to public comment? Yes, I have one comment that, and that is, thank you very much for bringing these gnarly issues to us. Sure. <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah, it is thank, nice. thank, thank, Thanks to staff for all the late David and, and, and Meg and others for all the late work as well. It was a, a heavy lift, but I think worthwhile based on, purely based on the volume of feedback you all gave, it seems like we're, we, we hit on something. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I would agree. I mean, I think uh, I appreciate your description of what all you've done to try to figure out how to deal with this. And I, I think that really helps to make the regulation uh, uh, draft uh, better from the get go. And uh, thank you again for giving us the roadmap ahead for what regulatory language uh, um, is on the, the, the agenda going forward. I think that's very positive. And uh, Margaret and I, you know, we've sort of on the committee for a long time. I mean, maybe a quarter of the time you have, Margaret, but it is nice to have a substantive discussion and be able to dig into something before it's done as, while it's still being cooked. And so I appreciate that. And, uh, thank you, Debbie and staff, for engaging us with that. I think that's the best use of the advisory committee, obviously. I think that's uh, well done. So with uh, we'll go ahead and open up to public comment on this uh, regulatory language around uh, closed schools. And, and this is, sorry, this is the moderator and we're opening public comment for the agenda item discussed. If you would like to make a comment on the closed schools process, you can look for the question mark, type the word comment and click send, or you may uh, raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon. And you can, if you are a call-in user, you may raise your hand by pressing star three. Are there any questions or comments? And I do not see any requests for public comment. Shall I close that feature? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Very good, we'll move on to agenda item eight, and that is the discussion of future agenda items. So committee members, do you have any Anything that you would like added to a future agenda? Uh, I had a couple of thoughts. One was I had raised the question about possible linkage to the fact sheet information for the student search. Uh, and I'm not sure that we want to do that. And I thought it might be worthwhile to have a discussion of that. I know as in the past, uh, I think a consensus was or a lot of people felt that the fact sheets were so inaccurate that highlighting them on the uh, BPPE page would be a disservice to students uh, because schools that were being truthful would be penalized because their scores wouldn't look as good as the schools who were lying. And uh, so I don't know whether we feel confident enough in those now that we think that would be good to link to it. Obviously. We have them so that students can get an idea of how well past students have done at an institution, but I just don't know uh, whether it's advisable and if it's advisable, how easy it is to do. And the other question I have, and I don't know if you've looked into this, but if you have, I'd be interested to hear about that, is um, we're talking about, you know, the website and, you know, students use of the website. Do you have any feedback on 
I guess it would be considered hits um, on the kind of things students are going onto the website for, or not students, but you know anybody. What 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 are people accessing the website for? If you have that information, I think that would be interesting to find out. Thanks, Margaret. Any other committee members with future agenda items? Uh, the only thought that I had, I will handle, be handled naturally, I think, which was a follow-up on the licensing, uh, or excuse me, not the licensing, the uh, annual report data and school performance fact sheets, which I think will happen as a matter of course. I'm sure it'll be included in the next uh, report as the reporting issues resolved. We can look into all of this. Great. Uh, can you remind me, Debbie, do we take public comment on future agenda items? I think we do, yes. I don't think we do, yes. Okay. So one last time, we'll go to open public comment. Thank you. And we've opened up the WebEx Q&A feature for suggestions of future agenda items. If you'd like to suggest a topic, you can click on the question mark icon, type the word comment into the text box there and click send, or anyone may raise their hand by clicking on the hand icon. And if our calling users may press star three to raise their hand. And I do not see any requests for public comment. Shall I close that up? Yes, thank you very much, Anne, and thank you for all your good work throughout the meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, committee members uh, and Chief Cochran. Appreciate it for all your work uh, throughout this meeting and in between. And we, will, our next meeting will also be uh, remote. I know we have the date set for that, and then we're all um, waiting to hear what happens in regards to those the summer and fall meetings, uh, whether they're in person or not. Thank you all. Go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Appreciate it. Hope you have a great afternoon. Bye, all. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Kenson. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Take care. Mm -hmm.